Thank you, Anurag, for, and thank you, uh, Embassy of India and Jetro, for inviting me here. Uh, I didn't know that I was being given targets here, but uh, that's fine uh, as such. <clears throat> um, I think Chris uh, and the ambassador have spoken about the opportunity uh, which exists here. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but fundamentally, uh, digital India is what we are talking about. And I, I keep saying it's digital investable India. Uh, and this consists of uh, three or four areas. One is digital, pure digital, this data related. The other is electronics. And the third one, which India is very, very now getting big into, is climate. Many people don't know that India's energy consumption is 22% renewable today. And uh, it's about to go to almost half of the uh, uh, consumption as such in renewables. Uh, how do I go to the next slide? Okay, I, I think I can. Okay. Uh, people have spoken about these numbers, but key important is that the space at which India is growing the pace at which India is growing right now, especially in what I call forward-looking technology areas, is very high. Forward-looking technology areas are in exports, which is uh, increasing phenomenally uh, as such from 2.2% of global exports to 4.5%. This is a Morgan Stanley report. All of you should, should definitely go through. Renewables, I mentioned, India's consumption is 22% today uh, of total consumption in renewables. And going up to 41%. IT services, very, very large uh, overall. There's one very important thing which takes place. Whenever the country's market cap in public markets tends to overshadow the GDP growth, that's a tipping point for a country. Recently, India's public markets crossed the GDP of $3 trillion. And to that extent, you'll see many, many <coughs> uh, new um, companies coming up. I must mention that in, and I have data slightly before COVID, um, the top 15 technology companies, uh, about 2010, constituted 15% of US GDP. The top 15 technology companies in 2021 constituted 40% of US GDP, only 15 companies. If you look at technology companies in public markets, the total industry constitutes 10% right now in public markets. So the scope for expansion to, because more technology companies are going public in India, we believe that as the GDP grows, Morgan Stanley's estimate is by 2030 to $8 trillion, the ratio of technology public market cap will rise from 10% to approximately 20%. Sorry. There are three elements which are part of the digital part. Uh, Chris mentioned a horizontal view of it. Let me mention the slicing as we see it. The first part is the startup world. S uh, there are total 90 odd thousand startups or 100,000 startups which are uh, registered with the government of India. However, the ones which have been funded, only funded by angels and VCs so far, is approximately 15,000 since 2007. And the revenue of those 15,000 companies is today approximately $30 billion. We expect that this $30 billion, which has been growing at 52% compounded growth in revenue terms, is expected to grow to $200 billion in a five-year time frame. So that's the market. The technology startups are of size. We are no longer a startup nation. We are today an industry of startup nations right now. The second part is electronics. And there are two elements to electronics, consumer electronics and defense electronics. Both these are growing. Consumer electronics is expected to be about $150 billion in five years from now. Defense electronics is another $150 billion uh, overall. The, all that through very major manufacturing productivity, production-linked incentives which the government has given 
so far and will continue to give, which will be formation of uh, um, uh, fabs and so on and so forth uh, in the market. Software. Software is an engine which is really growing right now. And today it's about $200 billion global revenue uh, as such, not including India right now. And we expect it to grow to 350 to 400 billion in five years time frame. India stack, the public good stack, which Chris mentioned, has a very major component called UPI. UPI facilitates instantaneous, in a nanosecond, mobile to mobile phone transfer of capital, transfer of money. Today, 270 million people use that in India. At one time, I was always asked, why is there so less credit cards in the country? My answer is very simple. India does not need credit cards. You'll be surprised to know that the total number of credit cards in the country possibly is 15 million for a population of 1 billion right now. Transactions on UPI are in billions of dollars. UPI has a plan to offer UPI infrastructure to 34 countries right now. Singapore has been enabled already. On certain assumptions that there's a certain market share UPI gains across the world, we expect UPI to be a $200 billion revenue public infrastructure good across 34 countries. And climate, not including solar infrastructure and windmills, on the data side is alone a small number right now as such. So these are the severe components, the, the specific components of digital, which we believe are investable by venture capital and private equity funds. I also want to mention, not unicorns, but another phenomena which has happened. Startups are now emerging to a billion revenue each. In our own portfolio, we have three companies which are almost a billion revenue each. They're going international, and we will see in the next, based on our knowledge about the startup ecosystem, in the next five years, we are expecting 25 such companies to hit 1 billion revenue each. So I'm not talking valuations because I believe valuations keep going up and down. We're talking about hard revenue. These are profitable companies, global footprint, and that's the very, very important part of the startup ecosystem today. Um, capital absorption is the other thing. These are all funded by global capital and Indian capital, which is emerging as a major player in the risk asset class for both VCs and private equity. If you look at the capital which has been absorbed by Indian startups in the last five years, it's approximately $150 billion. India has returned $100 billion to its LPs. In the next five years, we expect India to absorb $350 billion and return approximately $300 billion. This is an unstoppable engine. There will be ups and downs, no question about it. We are talking about funding winters. We are talking about death ratios in startups going up from 20 to 30 percent. However, that is part of the growth pattern. In every country, every startup does not succeed. There are few who succeed uh, as such. So capital, uh, today 90 percent of capital comes from international, 10 percent from Indian sources. We expect 20 to 25 percent of the capital in the next five years to come from India, 75 percent to come from outside India. The major source of risk capital provider for VCs and um, uh, private equity in India is US. The second biggest which is emerging is um, UAE. And the third biggest which I think will emerge is Singapore, is emerge Singapore. And I believe Japan has a major role to play here. Japan capital, which is more, many, much of it is corporate, which is very unique uh, as such. Most uh, countries do not have corporate capital off the balance sheet which has a technology in a strategic bent of mind is something which I think will be very valuable to India. One of the things which we are very, very encouraged about is what I call population scale building of businesses and investing. Let me explain that. India has a billion point four people who need efficient health care, who need efficient assurance, who need loans, and the list goes on. India has approximately 300 million consumers as students who are looking for digital education. India has approximately 150 million MSMEs and another 150 million small nano entrepreneurs. How do you make 
this a market which can be tapped by products and services? The first element is these people need to go and pay. To scale a company to that level cannot be done by trading products. It needs manufacturing, it needs design, it needs supply chain and warehousing efficiencies. Today, for all products and services, startups are now starting to set up and move the manufacturing base from China to India. In our own portfolio, we have seven such companies. Lenskart is a very good example. Lenskart is the largest eyewear manufacturer in the world. They do about 60,000 eyewear uh, glasses per day and that's done out of Delhi. Most important, these companies are moving outside the country and through organic and inorganic means. Lenskart just acquired one day in Japan. And together, this partnership is becoming very powerful because both of them are moving to larger markets potentially in China and the US. That collaboration power we have seen between Japan and India through Lenskart, which to us is now the Suzuki uh, role model of success in the olden days. In the digital days, we have one example already where Japan and India have collaborated between Lenskart and Ondius. I will skip all these. So, India is an investment opportunity because of scale, because of size, because of returns being in the top 10% to 25% quartile for global investors in dollar terms, because of a very large market, which I call population scale investing, and long-lasting billion-dollar companies being scaled through not just sales and marketing, but also to product development, manufacturing, material science investments, R&D investments, supply chain and warehousing. But most important, investors like us believe that when we take capital from a country like Japan or Middle East, we must give back. There has to be methodologies by which Japan and India both benefit from this collaboration. I think those are in the making right now. These will include R&D collaborations. These will do many, many uh, collaborations in the area of startup ecosystem. Many Japanese startups need to find big markets. India is a big market. Thank you very much. Many of you don't know this bottle of water was a sign for me to end my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much and happy to discuss offline.